Um, I'm going to hand you over uh, to Dr. Paul Thomas and Mark Champion. <laughs> right. I know. I think we will build the future, aren't we? Well, I'm not going to talk about the future. I'm going to talk about the past. I'm going to put us in context of how we got to where we are and basically why we need to go forwards. And then Mark's going to then bring in about the, the future and, and what we're doing to make things better. So, um, my time machine I'm going to take us through is actually this, these series of books. They, um, they've basically, back in the 90s, they went through all the peat around here and looked at the stratigraphy and all the archaeological evidence and you can basically piece a picture of the last sort of 10,000 years of the mosses and the wetlands in this area from the records in that peat. Now that peat tells a story of how, the, how they developed, how they grew, um, and each of those layers represents the plants that were growing on the surface at that time, and a record of the environment as it was at the time. So if we go right to the bottom of that peat, we end up in the Ice Age. So in terms of community involvement, there weren't no people around at that point. We just had ice. Now at the end of the Ice Age, it all started to melt. And there's loads of ice moving around. And we got to a stage where a lot of ice had basically piled up in the Mersey estuary and, and blocked it. And basically caused the, the river to actually flow over into the, into the deep. So you've got all this water sitting around over, basically what's the, the Mersey Valley now where all the mosses are, and that's dropping out all the silt, all the gravel, sands that all the glaciers have been busy mashing up for all those tens of thousands of years they've been covering the land. Uh, so as that melts, it kind of leaves this landscape behind of, um, of kind of valleys, small pools, uh, and mineral ridges, high ridges. So if we go back to the Neolithic, and you, you kind of looked around, this is the kind of environment you would have been in, kind of, there'd have been sort of old woodlands around you, and then within these sort of depression areas, low-lying areas within this sort of glacial sort of till, this clay and sand that's been left after the, after the glasses have melted, you'd have had this kind of environment with little lakes in it, botted around, and there were people in this environment. Um, you know, they, uh, that have been using this environment, and this environment is changing slowly over time because of the climate's changing, uh, and it rains less, the species change, it becomes drier, you get birds taking over. You've got big megafauna wandering around in this landscape, birds and aurochs and red deer, and these are all kind of a resource that the people can use, and some of the earliest archaeological remains we find in this area are flints. There's some found near Wilson uh, Hall um, as part of the, um, the wetlands survey. So yeah, that tells you they've got basically hunter-gatherer people living in this landscape. Uh, and you're using the resources, and they're already starting to change this landscape. You know, you, at that time, you've basically been in a great big woodland, and they're using fire to start to open up this landscape and create open spaces within it. Uh, basically, to make it easier to catch things like this. So, already, and we, we see that as layers of ash in the peat. So that's, you know, that's the very start of people trying to change and modify their environment. We move forward in time, we get to the Bronze Age, we've finished with the Stone Age now. Peats have started to accumulate in these valleys and they're starting to fill up with valley mires. This picture from the New Forest, but this is probably quite a good impression of what you would have seen if you, you'd have been in the middle of Chatmos back uh, in two, 2500 BC, you know, with peat filled valleys, woodlands on the high ridges and scrub on the high ridges, and people are starting to settle within this landscape, particularly on those mineral ridges that kind of broke up the little bits of bog 
that were across the landscape. You were getting little farmsteads maybe popping up. We're finding things like bronze uh, arrowheads and axes, um, red deer picks. So people are starting to maybe start to clear areas. We're seeing a lot more evidence of fire in this period. So they're, you know, they're really trying to open this landscape up. And probably that's having an impact. We see a change in the environment at that time. We've seen the, the landscape suddenly really open out. And the, these little mini bogs are all starting to join together. So we can start to get a much bigger kind of landscape of a, uh, a wetland. And you know, that's, that's there and through the Iron Age, it's, it's kind of building up peat slowly but surely. Uh, and, and then we get kind of a really wet period and the um, sphagnum moss takes over. And that's the sort of super species for in terms of bombing peat. Uh, and you know that's when we get lots and lots of peat and layers of meters and meters of peat being laid down. Still at that time, though, you know we get, we're getting almost to the Roman Britain now, first century, um, really first evidence of farming coming into this area. We're like a, a, a great Wolden Hall. We've got there's an enclosure there which would probably look like that roundhouse there or a series of those. Um, We've got religious significance in terms of the box, like this is um, the Worsley Man. There was probably some sort of like human sacrifice <laughs> culture going on, so that's people being sort of killed and put into the box. But also things like bronze statues are also be, have been found in the area associated with peat, actually in the peat itself. So obviously some significance of this environment to people. Now there's not much records in terms of the Middle Ages of what's going on, but we can kind of assume from sort of like the um, the way that it, it was used in other parts of the country that there have been you know, people with turbury rights to cut peat and to uh, basically use this huge kind of area of wilderness that was sat over the whole of Chat Moss and the, the whole Mersey Valley. It was common land, you know, so it, it was a resource for the community. I suppose that's the theme that's gone through all this. People are using this landscape to provide the things they need. You know, the food, the materials they need to build their homes, and all these sort of things. It's providing for that. Here it's providing food and fuel. And if you kind of look at the, um, this is a really good website actually. It's unfortunately didn't come up into Greater Manchester, but for, it covers all of Cheshire, because this is Carrington Moss. And you see all these very long, thin root, um, fields coming down to the edge of the moss there, and they're called peat rooms, or moss rooms. And they're basically a turbury right where somebody's ha had a, a right to cut peat into the edge of the moss, and it was kind of uh, a way of kind of parceling up these areas. Now, right about this, you know, getting into the kind of 1800s now, we're getting the rapid industrialization, the cities of Liverpool and Manchester are starting to grow, and uh, yeah, it, at the same time we're getting the sort of enclosure of the mosses. Basically, you, you know, you look on a modern map, you see all the, all the mosses now, and they've got names like Little Walden Moss and Chat Moss and Pestbolong Moss, and all, all these names that's on the modern on the survey map. But they're all associated with uh, a, a hall that's in that area. So each hall basically grabbed a bit of the moss and said, "That's no longer common land. We're going to put a big fence around it." And that's ours. And even as early as kind of seven, mid 1700s, we're seeing um, sort of court cases and things about turbid rights and trying to get the ownership over these these commons and, and this wilderness that was kind of sat in the middle of this area. So, one of the big things in terms of these city developments was there was kind of a, a gap between them stopping using cesspits and the, uh, the, the start of sort of municipal sewage uh, and you know pipes and sewers on the ground where they use these kind of toilets that basically emptied into a bucket and you would also took your ash in from your fire and this was kind of massive kind of what Victorian household waste was and they needed to get rid of it somewhere so the extract over there is from a book about how to reclaim mosslands and they did a case study on chat moss. So basically all these areas, they go, well, they're not really much use for anything. We're going to basically turn them into great big landfill sites. So 
all of Chat Moss, Carrington Moss, they're basically bought by the, uh, the, the, the council, basically, the Corporation for Greater Manchester, or, or Manchester as it was at the time, and they used them as great big t tips. Initially kind of brought it in my uh, by cart, which wasn't very efficient, but I meant we're in what, 1830s, 1840s, started getting the railways coming in, right up into the 1880s, and you start seeing these letters from the hall owners, the landowners, begging the railway companies to, oh, can you put a siding in on our land, because we want to bring the night soil in uh, to be able to sort of reclaim and make this mossland useful. So, you, know, you just look at, this is just an old map of the area, you can see on here all these little lines going around. These are all little railway lines that kind of came off the big railway lines so they could get this night soil from the cities out onto the moss and convert it into something that they thought was more useful. So, you know, something that looks like this one. So that kind of landscape you see on the mosses today, this is where it, where it originates from. Before that, it was still open mossland in the middle. It was still kind of a wilderness. And that had a massive effect. You know, this is basically the decimation of the Manchester mosses. See, from, from 1845 onwards, you just see this massive decline. This is referring to sort of intact bog with covered in and moss, you know, in a really healthy state. Um, and you can see it gets to, right through into the 70s, we're still lo losing, losing that habitat. Uh, but even, even where we, we didn't lose it completely, it was degraded. This is my sort of chart of doom. Uh, you can see, as you draw water level down in a mossland, you lose the characteristic species uh, until you basically end up with scrub. Um, and that's basically what happened with anything that was left. Uh, you know, we talked about peat cutting before. It was kind of a major, still a major land use right up into the sort of early 1900s. So first World War put a bit, put a bit of a break on things because there wasn't enough people to actually dig the stuff up afterwards. But this kind of left this landscape of these areas that were commercially extracted in the early 20th century, which were left with the acid peat intact, but drying out. And you know, this, this is what I was referring to before, you get this kind of process of, as the land, you know, even if the moss itself hasn't been destroyed, if it's got drains around it, it, it can't hold the water in, and it, it slowly converts over time into, wood, into sort of scrub and woodland. So if you, you know, you come back, so after the Second World War, um, you know, this is your typical Manchester Mosses site, you know, it was covered in purple moor grass, scrub, scrub encroaching. Um, not, not really active lowland race bog, but it still has the potential. And you know, these sites were still hanging on, this is from the 70s, this aerial photograph showing Chat Moss. And you can see there's these great big areas, this is Little Walden Moss at the bottom here, that's 100 hectares. You got uh, Astley and Bedford up there. This is one of the Chap Moss remnants. That's the Chap Moss peat extraction site. Astley Moss East. So all these were readily restorable sites that still had ha acid peat on them and were still restorable. But unfortunately, they found a way of digging peat up with, with machines. So we had another wave of destruction right right through into the 80s and into the 90s. Well, to be honest, it was only, it's only two years ago since peat extraction finished on chat moss. But you know, we just lost a lot of the, even these surviving sites. So it's a bit of a depressing story really of, of society kind of using the moss to meet its requirements. At first, you know, there was a, enough capacity in the system, but as time went on and commercial interests kind of got involved, it, kind of got to a stage where it's unsustainable. And then, going back, 76, I think we can probably say was the magic year, Risley Moss became a, a nature reserve. Uh, we got the Wildlife and Country Act in 1981. So nature conservation has become a thing. So places like Risley and Astley, the Lee Ornithological Trust, have got Astley Moss in the 70s. Is, as a reserve starting off, so 
we're starting to actually see these places to have a value in their own right. As a you know, place for people as well. It was the you know, local groups and local people who made these first sort of moves in to say, actually, we're not going to wipe this place out completely. We're going to do something about it. And so that's kind of where we got to, really. You know, we started restoring these places, and they've got legal protection, you know, became triple SIs, SACs, and, you know, having a value. Um, and, you know, we've reached the stage now where we're, we're saying, well, we've got, um, and maybe a society wants a value for them again. You know, these are massive stores of carbon, which in the current state are leaking it like mad because they're drained and they're dried out. So maybe society's got a new use for these areas as kind of, you know, carbon sinks, as kind of green lungs for, for our cities. And I know the, the combined authority in Greater Manchester are looking at this as a, a real, in terms of the broader sort of sustainable city strategy, because they can't do it without the people. And just to sort of illustrate what even where we've come in the last few years, that's looking probably as it did, has done for the last kind of 100 years, covered in purple mold grass, drying out, scrubbing encroachment, and we, uh, we re-wet it, and boosh, just even in a couple of years, we can turn it back to something that probably haven't seen since the, since the Iron Age, in terms of the community structure and its growing living bog again. And you know, there's, there's so many people involved in doing this, but it's you guys, who are actually doing the hard work out there and pulling the scrub and making it possible. So I've kind of got us up to date now, so I suppose I'll hand you over now to Mark to talk about the future. <laughs> right, just to join back in where Paul left. Um, not only he looked mainly at the, uh, the area of the Moslems, but our work, as you all know, spread um, across wider landscapes. So similar things were happening in the area where the Fenscape project, the Mersey rivers, um, and the ship canal. So there's a lot of, that's why the tidal carbon landscape was chosen because there's just so much going on. So in the north of the carbon landscape, um, the main industry was obviously coal, but not to uh, do down cotton industry, iron or um, iron and steel industries, trucks for the railways. So there was a whole heap of industry going on. And when in 1974 um, the area was investigated, it was the, the Wigan Borough, of which the others surrounding it were pretty similar, was. Uh, the second most damaged uh, borough in the UK. Strangely, because you wouldn't think it now, um, the most damaged was the China Clay area of Cornwall, where the Eden Project now sits. So um, it was pretty well damaged. And of all the sites that we sort of um, have a look at in the Greater Manchester wetlands area, um, less than 10% are in the, of the nature of conservation sites are in their original state. 90% of them are essentially on brownfield land. So it gives an idea of just how damaged the landscape um, this was. So it's really major um, part of the story of nature conservation, environment, and the carbon landscape and so on, is to remember where it came from So, one of the first jobs when I first arrived, um, looking again at the whole landscape, was restoring the reed beds. Due to the subsidence, going back to the coal mining, in this case, the reed beds had started to develop in the subsidence flashes. But the subsidence flashes um, had been used in the past for coal washing, tipping, processing other shales and wastes. And so they were full of piles of post-industrial spoil. They were uneven. The hydrology was badly damaged. There were perched reed beds where the reed beds were holding water because colliery shale and, and mud and, and the washings and so on um, are quite good at holding water. So there wasn't a consistent level in the reed beds. 
Um, and if you're looking mainly at things like fish eating birds, bitterns and so on, um, or even other species like uh, water, the trigon reed warbler, they all need a hydrology that works. Um, and it's really noticeable that they were so damaged and uneven that the hydrologies were uh, uh, absolutely messed up. So one of the first things we've done is to go in, level them, add uh, ditches, add other sort of features, trying to make the reed beds functional, uh, trying to get the hydrology all to work so that, again, you can get the fish passage, you can get the invertebrates, another, uh, the whole process of the reed bed working. So it's just, again, as Paul said, you're looking not only at straightforward restoration, but it's about the restoration of the processes and the functions of these habitats. Um, and over a million cubic metres of post-industrial spoil have been moved around in the work that just I've done. So that doesn't include the sort of other stuff down at the Mosslands and things. There's absolutely huge amounts of volume of uh, soil moving to recreate that functioning landscape that was back here uh, in the Middle Ages or the Iron Age. Um, it's got a lot of work to do to go back to that sort of functionality. Again, got another, we've got uh, opportunities for creating meadows. There is only now 3% of the meadows that were around prior to the Second World War. But the colliery shale um, was restored in such a way and uh, seeded with a range of wildflower seeds back in the early 80s. And this means that with management, hay cutting on an annual basis, um, we can recreate those meadows. And what we can do is statistically, we have looked at how the progression of the meadows is. And we can see that by managing them by hay cutting and developing the meadows um, in that way, adding this species of plant here, the, the yellow rattle, which is fundamental to the dynamics of a, of a hay meadow. We can recreate hay meadows and they start to bring back in the invertebrates and the orchids and many different species of plant. The, spe the fields, I haven't got the good bits yet, and the fields start to really develop well. So next slide, so they've just told me to hurry up and mean like that. So orchids move in, um, that's really good. And uh, so there's one species of plant every year that's a hay meadow type species colonizes naturally, which is exciting. And they're pretty good for invertebrates too, look, there's a brimstone. And, but the point is that they're now working, they're functioning back as they were. So that's really rather nice. And the other thing is that the, the hay is being used commercially by farmer. Uh, so it's, again, it's starting to get the whole process of the functionality of the landscape back. So, Paul started with this, but it's the Mosslands. They were really, really, really badly damaged. I think we made that clear. So we want to change them. Um, this is Little Walden, which was recently being P1. Um, and by bunding it and putting in water control features, we can get that water table back up, back to Paul's chart and table. We can start to get the sphagnum to grow. And when we've done that, we can start to get it level, get it looking nice and wonderful, and shush, back to the Iron Age, as Paul put it, which is always a good thing. Right, one of the, yeah, one of the best fits we've now got is things like GIS mapping. When I started in 1999, this would have been a bit dreamy, but now we can look for opportunities across the landscape. We can see where there's places where we can do restoration, how we can get develop the links. We can start to plan using GIS, how to get the water to move nicely across the site. So it's been really good and drone flights and loads of technology, which is helping us now. And at Bickershaw sure, here, we've got the opportunity for multiple benefits for ecosystem services, which sounds really, really kind of Posh and boring, um, but there we've got the opportunity to slow the flow, catch water, hold water within the landscape. So we're not only are we getting the wildlife benefits, restoring the landscape, getting rid of the post-industrial um, 
products, we're making the landscape look smarter, we're getting it to actually function and protect um, housing for flooding. So that it's really quite exciting. And you can see we've restored rivers or streams back to their channels. We started putting in meanders that are nicely working. This was in a concrete trapezoidal channel all being held in. It took half an hour for the water to whiz through the system really quickly. Now it meanders, it goes over little waterfalls. It's all exciting. Waterfalls just like those. Um, well done, Paul. Um, it's, so it's really quite good. We designed all these things up and it's, it's dead funky. Good for plants, invertebrates. They're being colonized really quickly. And you can see nicely, looking nice in the landscape, much nicer than a straight trapezoidal channel, I hope. Um, so there you go, atmosphere, rud, chub, great crested newts, water boatmen, invertebrates. It's really quite good for a whole range of wildlife, but it's also really good for a whole heap of things that benefits the people of Wigan Borough Lee going down into the Warrington, so it's a really good multiple use system. And you can see there's a little waterfall, that's what those black and white pictures look like when they're in them. Um, and you can see it's holding water back under storm conditions, which is nice. And we've got cattle grazing, um, and these are the rare breeds, so you're looking at rare breed conservation as well. But also those are the type of cattle that really graze the land well and are good for grazing. So you're getting benefits of breeding birds. But again, people are actually coming to visit the, the red pulse. So there's a whole heap of, of benefits from getting that farming system um, at low inputs going just generally in the background. So we've covered that, but it's good for, it's good for in, uh, recreation, mental health, getting people out. It's much nicer to walk amongst the uh, waterfalls, the rivers, the mosses, um, that it is post-industrial spoil with bits of angle iron sticking out. So, uh, pond, they've got, there we've got reintroductions. It's great doing all this work, but if you don't restore the entire functionality, get in some of the plants, try and revert it, get the sun juice growing on the moss. Um, it's all a little bit pointless. So one of the really important things we're doing now is bringing back the species that would have been here last seen in 1840. Um, back to the mosses. So, lesser bladder wort, that's growing really rather nicely now in Astley, growing nearly as well at Risley. Um, white big sedge, been reintroduced to Risley, found growing wild at Astley, but it's looking at bulking up that population, getting a whole system going with some really smart uh, biodiversity. And then, also, the invertebrates, we want the system to work, we want it to look really good, be really exciting, and the bird butterfly called the Manchester Argus originally, found in the Manchester mosses, um, large heath, um, bringing it back, hopefully going to release it next year, so that's kind of exciting. Bosch put cricket, get it back where, um, on all the mosses, so it's not just on these little locations that it is at the moment. So the, again, the whole landscape is working dynamically with all these different species uh, working within the landscape. And it's really good, we're looking again this morning with students, looking for opportunities so there's research and these are just some of the things that have been going on that I know of um, research projects in the sort of area that is the carbon landscape. So again there's the next generation because um, apparently I'm not immortal, <laughs> used to me, um, but you know next generation what can they do with it? Continue in all those studies that Paul looked at. So there's again there's a whole sort of academic studies and, um, and school visits and getting it out there so there's loads of stuff. I think that's it. Yeah. I nearly did it. Look, we've one minute to spare. Woo! Yeah. Whoa.